conductive wire And you were so electric I had no say when you came so near And just passed right through me Hey everyone, welcome to Geekdom is back, as is Scott Fuger. He's been away from the podcast for a little bit, but he recommended that I read a recent comic called Thumbs, which was put out by Image. And Scott, I want to thank you for recommending something that was nice and quick to get through and also very enjoyable. Yeah, of course. Uh, it was a pleasure for me to uh, read through it. I, I was actually reading it monthly. Um, I had found um, the team of Sean Lewis and Hayden Sherman back when I first started um, getting back into comics and was like going to comic book stores. Um, the previous uh, miniseries that they had done called The Few, Hayden Sherman's like artwork just really popped out to me. And even though issue two was the only issue available where I was, I grabbed it and I read it and I loved it. So I immediately tracked down issue one Um and I mean, Thomas has blown me away even more than The Few did. <laughs> yeah, I had heard about The Few, but I had never picked it up. So I wasn't as familiar with this creative team as you were going into this. But just reading the first issue and the fact that they were lengthier issues than usual, too, I think was appealing to me because that meant they knew exactly how long they wanted the story to be. It wasn't something that was going to be, you know, pushed to 10, 12 issues just for the sake of being you know, a limited maxi series or mini series, whatever the comic book publishers are calling them these days. I can't seem to keep track. But usually when you have publishers like Marvel or DC, they have a certain length that they want the runs to be. And then you just have to keep going and going and hope you have enough story. But with Image, the nice thing is that it's all creator own comics. So you have these people who bring these stories to Image and Image kind of looks at them and is like, okay, yeah, we'll publish this. And I don't know what the details are on their deals, but I've like checked out the submissions page just out of curiosity. And it's like, if you're a writer and you don't have an artist, get an artist first. You know, they're not <laughs> in the business of building these super creative teams for you. You have to sort of do that on your own. Whereas I feel like with the big two, Marvel and DC, they're more inclined to be like, hey, we're going to get this A-list writer and this A-list artist and put you two together on a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. It definitely does lend itself to a different kind of, um, I guess, like attention to detail in some ways. I mean, obviously, with the Marvel Universe and everything, they have extreme attention to detail in other ways. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just like, you can really tell that a lot of their stuff is like, extremely crafted by the the team and like it's being told like like you said like the way that they want to tell it which i love yeah and for anyone who isn't familiar with thumbs the story is based on this tech millionaire or billionaire or whatever he is sort of the mark zuckerberg of this <laughs> era and he creates this technology that just goes so wrong. And I think that's definitely a relatable fear that people have with certain tech companies today. You're like, you know, maybe you shouldn't create this thing and have no way to make sure bad things aren't going to happen with it. <laughs> and you really just see Adrian Camus, I guess, his I tech. Think I, I say it as Camus in my mind. But okay. I don't know which like, is the, correct. like the classic author. <laughs> <laughs> But he really just goes all in on the tech that he designs. And you see as the story progresses what happens to him because of what he's done. And you have this sort of futuristic dystopia in this that really just came to life on the pages. And the story in itself was intriguing because of the fact that you're kind of like, you know, this isn't what the world looks like now, but you could see how it could get to something like that, even though hopefully it never will. Yeah, definitely. And so like the, the technology that you mentioned is uh, basically a replacement mother. Uh, they call it mom. And it essentially, you know, takes care of children while parents are out either working or you know, living their life as they kind of would without children, which is um, a little bit strange, but I could definitely see how, you know, it would be appealing in some ways and how it would kind of feel normal for a child because, you know, if that's all you've ever really known, then 
Um, <laughs> you know, it's, you just kind of have to accept that. Um, and I think like the the relatability is certainly something that um, jumps out about the book. But and also I feel like a lot of just the the strong themes that um, come out in it, mm-hmm. like um, you know, the technology of the mom is something that was kind of is I believe is like offered as free to people and yeah you know it's just kind of like the idea of throughout the book children kind of being exploitable and disposable um and then the idea of kind of like controlling the poor by giving them things that like on the surface appear to be good for them but are ultimately kind of benefiting the higher-ups and have these kind of like ulterior motives such as like you know making camu's army yeah, you have so many moving parts too with the technology because you have the mom, you have the training that a lot of young kids are going through. And while that's not necessarily tech based, they are put into these simulations or at times not even simulations. They're like real world things going on and they're competing. And it's like the two top candidates will make it to the next level. And you just have this dire state where it's like the mom technology was built to give kids a chance at life who didn't have great parenting or just didn't have the privilege that other kids had. So this allowed them to essentially make something of themselves. But at the same time, you could tell it was causing so much destruction. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, mentioning the like training software, uh, the, the two big competitors that uh, become, you know, like the main characters in the book are Nia and Thumbs. Uh-huh. And um, I, I think it's really interesting how, like, kind of from, from the beginning, Nia is like presented as Thumbs is better, um, like kind of in every way. But they, like they talk about him kind of having be more like the brains behind things like they she kind of has the you know the soldier like uh loyalty and then mm-hmm. he's kind of like the coordination um like the creativity in like how to solve problems um and you know by the end of the book he's kind of like the one that is showing the most kind of like emotions and compassion um, so I think that's like a really cool and interesting um, like dichotomy, and the way that they are kind of like presented as these opposite equals in some ways. And the fact that they make the guy the more emotional one, too, I think was a nice little change of pace from, you know, stereotypes between genders and things that you tend to notice. And I think people are getting more comfortable with changing today. So you have these characters who both are likable for their own reasons. And they're very different reasons, you know, she's never going to give up and thumbs or Charlie, if you prefer, he is sidelined for so long that even though he's been taken out of the picture, when the two of them see each other again, it's just like, they waste no time at all. And I think with this being five issues, even though they are lengthier issues, it just lends itself to the story so well because they're like, okay, there is no filler. You know, you're not going to have this random issue that has nothing to do with anything or is just sort of a sidebar to something else. Instead, it's just action packed. And we haven't even talked about the art yet, but we will get to that soon. I just think the story was so well paced, even though that pace seemed very fast. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you're definitely you're like thrown right into Charlie essentially being gravely injured. Um, and then you kind of do a flashback to give a little more context as to like, you know, how mom came into being and uh, eventually became outlawed and everything. Um, and then you're kind of brought back into the future, which is, you know, I think, was it like 12 or 16 years or something that uh, yeah. Charlie has been in a coma and then he he's woken up to just like total devastation of the the fortress and he's kind of like left to fill in those blanks uh with the help of his mom which is like the last remaining mom right and then he has to find his sister tabitha who has basically joined the other side and you have this relationship between them that 
hasn't really had a chance to foster the way it should have, and she's sort of been brainwashed into believing it's all his fault. So they go through the motions as well, and by the end of it, you get this satisfactory ending of, okay, you know, you got this reunion, at least, and you have these things that all accumulated up to this final moment, and it was just so well done. Definitely, and I I feel like... That it was also it was uh, like a believable way for things to happen, but it was also you know like kind of shocking um, in many ways as well. Um, but I and I think you know just going back to like the relationship between like Charlie and Tabitha and Nia and how they all kind of overlap. It's it's really interesting how um, like Tabitha when they were younger it, it shows her kind of like defending. Uh, Charlie when the moms are first outlawed and you know like sticking by his side in that way and then you see her you know years later having the the total opposite when she's kind of like brainwashed and uh, becomes like an advocate Um, but then kind of as soon as you know Charlie returns it kind of goes right back to that and then um, Nia is essentially kind of the same character all the way through until Mm -hmm. the the very end when she has um, I guess a sort of like redemption and I mean, Charlie kind of shows the most growth, even though he's the one that was like out of commission for the longest. He, yeah. you know, woke up in a totally different world. And in some ways he was able to, that helped him like adapt to it even faster. Plus you have the fact that Tabitha was told he was dead. So then when she sees him, she immediately knows that she has been lied to. And that should sort of make the light bulb go off in her head, like, hey, what else have I been lied to about? But because she's been in the program for so long, it's harder for her to do that. And, you know, she has this one person who has been looking out for her there and cares about her. And it's a tough situation because she's built this new relationship with someone. And granted, it's a much different relationship than a brother sister one it's still this sort of protective relationship at the same time and we see that when her friend in the program whose name i'm totally blanking on right now meets charlie it's uh neve neve okay and he meets charlie and they just butt heads right away because they're both trying to protect her in different ways and you know charlie has supposedly been out of or not supposedly charlie has been out of the picture for so long that you know for neve it's like okay, do I believe him? Do I not? Like, what's going on here? I don't know who to fight. (laughs) And he struggles with it. And I like that we get to see that struggle despite how fast this comic just runs through everything. Yeah, it's it's really cool how um, they, like, they they show Neve kind of, like, turning on the power, or in his mind, and probably in actuality, he's um, staying true to, like, his promise as an advocate to like be for compassion and um, humanity and everything. But whereas as soon as there's the threat of the single mom returning and essentially, you know, taking over the world through like the technology cloud that still exists, um, the power immediately changes and kind of is there. I believe there's, there's a quote somewhere in the book where it's kind of like, um, Adults claim they want change until it affects their home and their comfort, um, which I think is very, like I said, another one of those themes that kind of just like really sticks out um, because the power does kind of like, as soon as there's that threat, they flip the switch where they're all about self-preservation. And um, because he was like brought up in it, Neve kind of sticks to what he was taught as the the tenets of being a human and that it, like he's able to st- keep those convictions even when Cora from one of the two of the powers could like basically she, I think she like punches him in the face and is like no you gotta fight for us and then just the way like when the there's like a building collapsing that collapses and puts Neve and Charlie on one side and Tabitha on the other and the way that the two just kind of bond over that love for Tabitha rather than and like immediately their di- differences are just like put out the window. Um, I think that's like a really cool thing to, you know, show about kind of the way that humans work. Ultimately, too, this is a story about people sticking together in one of the hardest times the world's ever been through, really, or at least their part of the world, because you have so few 
people who seem willing to rebel against this group that is sort of controlling everything now. And these characters come together to accomplish that with the technology. And in the end, they are able to sort of be rewarded with that freedom and safety, even though, you know, that's Charlie's big sacrifice. He's doing this all so Tabitha can have this, regardless of whether or not he will end up having it. Yeah, and another kind of like recurring thing in the the book is kind of like the idea of people as individuals being kind of like like good, and then once they kind of become groups, um, there's the potential for it to get kind of like corrupted by uh, quote unquote like higher vision. Um, So I think that is. just something that really stood out to me as just very, very interesting um, and kind of like, I guess just like, like I said, a really interesting observation, just the way that like kind of all the characters like embodied the different aspects of that. Yeah. Well, is there anything else about the story specifically that you want to mention before we dive into how the artwork played a big role in making this so enjoyable? Oh, I guess just, Another of the main things that really stood out to me is kind of the how it's like a war of extremes. On one side, there's mm-hmm. Nia and the rest of like the what's remaining of Camus army. Um, how they're they believe that the power is totally evil and basically have their faith almost totally in technology. And on the flip side, the power um, they're kind of blinded by their hatred of technology because of the way it affected and in some ways led to the death of their children. And, you know, Thumbs is kind of stuck in the middle where he grew up with that technology, but then he's also able to see the drastic differences in the world um, in the time that he was in a coma. Um, So he's kind of like that uh, impartial third party where, you know, it makes it even more clear how, you know, extremes are kind of never the right way to go. Yeah, it's just so well done all around. I feel like I'm going to say that a lot this episode. But with the artwork from Hayden Sherman, you have this grittiness of this world that just comes through. And the fact that there aren't that many colors used in the comic, too, I think just amplified that because you sort of have, you know, this brighter pink that is prominent in every single issue and then you mostly have like muted blues grays and black all throughout so you have this contrast with this pink color and then everything else and i just thought it worked so well for the state of their world everything they were going through the fact that you know mom as a technology is able to stand out in such a way yeah, definitely. I really do love the way that, you know, he uses pink to just really make things pop and, you know, highlight a specific part of the image. Like Every time that it's used, it's like meant to draw your attention to whatever it is. And I think that's a really interesting, you know, like technique. And he kind of did that in the few as well. It was mostly like reds and whites. Um, but I feel like this just you know appeals to the senses even more with the you know just the harsh contrast of like the dark blacks and then the the bright pink um and his artwork style as well like the of the actual drawings is something that really um i love as well um it's a lot of like really straight lines kind of like like sketches that have been you know have like a once over to make them you know that much better but it also has that raw feeling Um, And, you know, the way that the straight lines, he uses them a lot to show movement. And I think that it's like really effective, especially with the kind of smaller bit of or the the lesser color palette. Um, I think like, you know, the the really clean and straight lines um, make it still like stand out and feel like like a realized work of art in that way. It really felt like a simplistic art form for a very complex story. And I like that because... Sometimes you'll turn the page in a comic and you're looking at it and you're like, there is so much detail here. It's like, it's going to take me longer just to look at what they drew than it is to read the actual page. And, you know, some pages don't have any dialogue or anything on them anyway. And you're just sort of staring at it in awe. And while this wasn't 
extremely detailed in the way that you'll see with the house styles for Marvel or DC. It was something that just matched the story so well to where you didn't care if it didn't look absolutely perfect. It's like, no, this gritty, raw look is exactly what we would expect for this kind of story. And sure, there's times where you could take a very technological story and go all out with it and go into super amounts of detail because, you know, Iron Man, very tech savvy character, <laughs> lots of gadgets and toys. And that makes more sense for that kind of story because this, it was like one technology that took over and one mom was left. So you didn't need it to be overly detailed because you got a sense that everything was moving so fast. They weren't paying attention to those things anyway. It's like the colors made you pay attention to what really mattered. Yeah, it, it definitely draws your eye right into so you can pinpoint exactly what you need to know about that page and almost, you know, like allow everything else almost to be like in your peripheral vision. Um, and I think that also works really well with Sean Lewis's writing style. And like I said, like all the, you know, how relationship based this is and how um, like theme based it is, it really lets that, um, you know, shine in its own way as well, uh, where like the artwork kind of backs that up without, you know, overpowering it. Yeah, all around this creative team does such a nice job of blending the writing with the art and the colors and just making the story come together as a whole. And I mentioned earlier the oversized issues. I think most of them were around 30-ish pages, give or take. And, you know, most comics run the 20 to 22 length and then... The other pages are sort of filled with advertisements if you're getting, you know, the single issues instead of reading it online on Marvel Unlimited or DC Universe later. But I really like that this creative team was like, okay, here's the story. Here's what we're going with. Because we're only going to release five issues and it's going to be once a month, which is how these came out. And, you know, the trade is actually coming out the day after this episode is going up. So it's kind of perfect timing here to be discussing this one. It's a very recent comic and everything just seemed to fall into place for this. And I really, really enjoyed reading it. It felt like one of the more unique comics that I've read recently. And, you know, I did read Mr. Miracle recently as well. And that is certainly unique in its own way, but it's still, you know, from DC Comics. So it did have some rules that had to follow probably, but it seems like they're getting a little more flexible with certain stories like that was a limited maxi series. So they had a little more leeway, I feel like, to play with the character, but this, it just felt like this whole world was dropped in your lap and in five issues it was gone, but it was so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I think you you mentioned like kind of the lack of advertisement. I think that certainly helped with the um, the flow of it, uh, like we've been talking about, how it just kind of feels nonstop. I think it would be very jarring um, to have, you know, something kind of distract you in the middle of it. And um, the first four issues had, you know, short backup stories that I wanted to mention because okay. they kind of had a really cool way of, you know, reinforcing the themes in the um, main story. Uh, like the, the first one was kind of, you know, holograms of people who had died and how that was kind of used as a way to avoid grief, um, which, you know, in the story, the power kind of uses their hatred of technology as a way to avoid, like, you know, truly facing, like, the reality of their children, of what happened to their children. They, like, they pretend that it's kind of, um, you know, in order to make, stop that from happening again, but it, it's essentially just a distraction for them. And then the second one was kind of like, these animals who had lived in a world where uh, technology had essentially replaced all humans um, and it kind of like showcased like the kind of imperfections of humans and like the way that, you know, you can't put your full faith in technology because, you know, the robots couldn't understand the pets needs. So they were kind of on their own, which kind of, you know, harkens back to, you know, how mom shouldn't have been, you know, these children's sole means mm -hmm. of, you know, being raised. And then, let's see, the, the third one was kind of like, it was Captain Future, I believe, and it was, 
you know, these kind of higher up, he was kind of like a force of good and these higher ups trying to manipulate his feelings of love and turn them into anger to be used against their enemies. And, um, you know, that has very obvious parallels to the story as well. And then um, the last one was probably the most strange of them all. They, they all have a very different artistic style from each other and from the main book, which I thought was also very cool. The last one was kind of like these weird skeletons of like animals that had become extinct or something. They were like dinosaurs and like very strange stuff. And there's like one human who's still alive, who kind of was a part of this world, but not fully. He was kind of like invisible to the world. And, you know, he's doing like these uh, like crimes for the ruling animals or whatever. And he's kind of going on about how his life, you know, wasn't that great and how he's kind of like a bad person and everything. But then at the end, he finds that there's another human and he is working to, you know, save them um, and kind of like runs away from that, the life that he'd been living. And he kind of says like how when humans are, you know, all, they all exist, you know, they kind of don't give a shit about each other. But then when it's like, you know, you're down to the last two, you really care about each other. And that kind of goes back to the idea that I mentioned before about like, you know, people being really pure as individuals, but then being able to be like corrupted as a group. Yeah, well, I think if I keep going on, I will probably just keep repeating myself. But one of the last things I want to mention are the covers for the single issues, because I like the absence of color to create these images and then you have you know the pink thumbprint on the black background and i think it just stands out so much and they look so good too (laughs) yeah for sure it's just another way that like the art style really pops and catches your eye and like i like i said the few was one of the first ones that i picked up because it caught my eye and i'm sure even if i hadn't known this creative team Thumbs would have done the exact same thing. And I'm really hoping that we end up getting like a really nice hardcover trade at some point, because I think just like the quality of even the single issues is really awesome. And I think it really lends itself to being, you know, collected in that nice uh, hardcover package. Yeah. Well, if anyone wants to pick this up in trade format that's available tomorrow, head to your local comic book store, see if they have it in stock. If not, they all can order it. It's an image title. It should be pretty easy for them to get. But Scott, do you have any final thoughts before we wrap up? Not really, just that I'm really excited to see what uh, this team comes up with next. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to go back and check out the few because I like it when stories are nice and short and easy for me to get to in, you know, an hour or two, which is... (laughs) you know, nice in comparison to my Stephen King reading that I've been doing for Chat Cemetery lately, because that takes a lot more than two hours. <laughs> yeah, th- these are definitely very dense, but very rewarding. Yeah. Well, before we go, I quickly want to let you all know about our Patreon. You could support the podcast for a dollar a month. You'll get a thank you on the show or $5 a month. will get you the chance to pick a topic for me to discuss on the podcast. And you can find us on Twitter at Geekdom Pod, on Instagram and Facebook at Welcome to Geekdom. Scott, thank you for coming on to discuss this today. Thank you. I hope everyone enjoyed. <laughs> Same here. And to our listeners, as always, thank you all for listening, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.